Hey, welcome everyone. My name is Seth Miranda. This is Adorama Live Events, and we are coming to you live from the actual Adorama store itself at 42 West 18th Street, right here in New York. And here, 22 years ago, a major world event happened that changed the course of everything. And I thought it was important to pull in some really respected professionals from our industry, our community, that were there firsthand, award-winning, long-time photojournalist. Their list of credentials, both of your list of credentials are ridiculous, by the way. Yours, yeah, I feel like you've been in every publication ever created. Um, let's start, off, I just want to introduce both of them. So first I have Jennifer S. Altman, who, like I said, has been in so many publications, it's insane, but your, your 9-11 photos themselves are actually in the NYPD, the Police Museum here in New York. Yes. Yeah, so it's a whole collection. Um, in the Police Museum, no. In Sorry, in the police museum, it's just uh, a couple of pictures, but in the 9-11 museum, there's a lot. Okay, and uh, on the other side over here, we have Stan Honda, who uh, has been here, you both have been here before, you were here for the Women's uh, in Photojournalism panel a long time ago, I think. Stan, you've been here like 20 times talking about stars and eclipse and astrophotography and stuff, and I, and I don't think people even are aware of a lot of the photojournalistic stuff you did um, in 35 years about that you've had a career, which is crazy, and you have a few images actually in the 9-11 Muse Memorial Museum itself. Right, right. I think there's about three there. All right. So I mean, that's a that's a it, it's a it's a big. It sounds weird. It's like a big accomplishment uh, because it's like a tragic thing, but it's also as a photo journalist and as a, a creator and, a, and someone who documents. That's a big deal. Yeah, it's a nice it's a nice honor. I think to to have the pictures displayed like that. Uh, you guys can you you can hear Stan fine, but not Jennifer. Okay. Um, you want me to give you a handheld? Would that help you out? No, I can. I can hold it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Sorry, guys. I got these are brand new mics, and the event space is brand new. We're still figuring out what what our setups are here. Um, I wanted to get going with the idea. Um, we're going to go through their images as we. Uh, as we talk through this tonight, but I really wanted to get a sense of, uh, first of all, there's new creators coming out of the uh, out of our industry now that weren't even alive or old enough to even remember what happened that day. And I think we are also in an era where things are covered differently and the methodology and the processes are different. So I wanna know, one, were you called down there? Were you just happened to be there? And if you were in on your way over to 9-11, the towers are struck, they're falling, there's chaos. What did you do for yourself to get prepared to go do this job? Let's start with Jennifer. Would you like to start? Would you want to start, Stan? Go ahead. Was, that, was that a bit too crazy to start off with? Did you guys want to start? What's your favorite color, Stan? Do you want to start <laughs> off easier? <laughs> I, I got a call from one of our, um, another photographer, uh, Hen, uh, Henny Abrams. Uh, we were both freelance photographers, and we were working for Agency France Press here in the New York office. So Henny watched wa uh, watched the uh, the morning news all the time on television. So he called me and said that a, a plane had crashed into the World Trade Center. And I think at that time, uh, us and a lot of people thought it might have just been a small plane. Uh, and, and so he, so he said, let's let's both try to get down there. And so he contacted our boss, and then. We were we were on our way down. Um, I live in in um, Upper Manhattan, so uh, we were uh, my wife and I live near the number six line, six train. So that goes all the way down to City Hall. So I went, uh, got on the train, and got out. And the the, ver the first couple pictures that you saw on the slideshow were uh, what I saw coming out of the City Hall subway stop. And at that time, I uh, I just heard about the first plane. So I see both of the towers in flames and so I, I had no idea about the second plane and I think just the entire day was like that uh, at least for, at least for me and I think for a lot of photographers I saw where it was just total chaos you had no idea what was happening at that time we didn't have smartphones or anything so you couldn't really keep up on anything and a cell, most of the cell phones went out at that time and uh, I managed to find a couple of landlines that were working I, I, I could call uh, my bosses in New York and in Washington uh, but it's it's something I, I mean I don't know about Jennifer I don't think you could prepare for anything like this because yeah. we're used to uh, things like airplane crashes or or big building fires but this is just beyond the experience I, I, I think of, of, of anybody it was just uh, something that you just couldn't yeah you, you couldn't uh, get get your uh, kind of get a get a grip on I mean it was massive I can't even imagine first of all you don't even know what's happening next let alone yeah. what's happening yeah. now right. No, you, no, you had no idea because 
you didn't know what was happening. I mean, I, I didn't know that these were that these were passenger planes, and I didn't know anything about the planes in Washington or Pennsylvania. And so there was just uh, lots of confusion as to what was just happening in in Lower Manhattan. Yeah, there was. I actually saw it happen. I was going to an assignment. It was a little different because. Um, can you hear me? I was going down uh, the FDR towards an assignment for Newsday that day, and it was my first day working for them. Um, and I saw it just happen. And then I didn't see what the explosion was, but then I pulled my car over on the highway, which you should never do. Um, and then took some pictures, and then a cop you know, said to go off. And I had actually called my editor. My cell phone was still working, and I said, I'm going down there. Um, I parked my car by the Brooklyn Bridge and then just kind of ran down. You might just speak a little loud. Thou yeah, and then thousands of people were kind of coming the other way, and you're running that way. And then the second plane flew over, so I knew what was happening, but um, I did not expect what happened. So, so that's the question I have is where's the line for you, especially when you don't know what's happening, where's the line of getting your job done, covering it, and your own safety? So, I mean, like Stan was saying, we couldn't really prepare for it because we didn't know. Like, I was going to do, shoot a political story. Um, so, hi. <laughs> um, you know, I didn't really feel fear. Um, I kind of felt driven to do it. And I felt like it was, you know, you have to kind of reevaluate yourself and think when thousands of people are going one way and you're going the opposite way, you know, kind of what are you doing? But I felt like all my training really came into play. Yeah. And I knew how to move and how to move out of scenes quickly. Um, and I felt really just in tune with my techniques and my the way that I kind of conducted myself. And I felt like everything kind of merged at that moment. And I felt confident. Well, I feel like the job never ended for you, right? Because, like, your, here's some of your images of after the fact, right? Like right. it wasn't just that day. This was right. It was five years of five coverage, years, right. right? Oh, definitely. You yeah. too, right? Yeah. Even today, like I did something, you know? Yeah, especially uh, uh, for the for the following weeks and months, it was just solid coverage uh, of, of the story. There were, really was no other story to, to cover at yeah. that time. Yeah, it, it was crazy, and and. Just to give people an idea that weren't from this, it sounds like crazy that we're saying error because it was just it was 20 years ago. But like things have changed so much, you can take your phone out right now and live stream something that's happening to whoever and get it slung around the internet. What was it, was it frustrating trying to get what you were covering out fast enough while you were still trying to cover it? Or and I'm talking about the day of more than anything because you're like I'm shooting, I'm shooting, I'm shooting, but it, it's not going anywhere unless it's out of that camera and to to the public. So, so was right. this, how was the speed of getting it well, out? There? I had to pull myself out. Like, um, I finally got, I had climbed into like a building um, where I was able to get a landline and then called my editor. And so I knew like what their deadline was. And then I, you know, kind of hustled at the time that I thought I could get up there. But it took a long time, you know, like hours to get uptown. Oh, I'm sure. Oh, yeah. everything was great. Everything was locked out. No one knew what was going on. Everything everything had to stop. Well, there was, yeah, there was no public transportation. I think I was on the last subway to go into City Hall, really? and after that, there was nothing. Yeah. Uh, buses and subways had stopped, but, um, but I, yeah, it was the same, I think, same for me. I, working for AFP, we were, we're an international wire service, and so they have deadlines constantly, and around 11 a.m. in the morning, it, it would have been 5 p.m., European Central European time, and mm -hmm. so editors are wanting pictures of what's what they're seeing on live on the television now, uh, and so they uh, at the time uh, we were just about a year into working solely with digital cameras. Right. Um, no, and, not even, not even a whole year. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Almost a year, because then uh, we uh, I had just finished shooting two weeks of the U.S. Open tennis, which is here in New York. Right. Uh, and so we were. <clears throat> Usually we would have a computer with us, and we, we could transmit uh, actually from, a, a, as long as we get an internet connection somewhere. And back then, you, you'd go to a Starbucks or someplace like that for an internet connection. There was, there was no time to grab a computer, and so I had to make my way back up to our Midtown office. After a couple, after a couple hours of photographing downtown, then I ended up walking uh, up to Midtown. So 
because because there was no transportation. But the, and and then uh, my boss and I went over the pictures and and, uh, and finally sent them out. And and you must have documented like crazy. Like you just you just kept shooting and shooting. So how do you get to a point where you're like take a second to even cull through it to some point to make that story as coherent as you can? I ran out of film actually. <laughs> I, like, believe you did. I had half. Uh, I had my one digital camera, you know, oh. that I had only gotten like a month before, I think, and I only had a certain amount of cards, and then I had film camera, and I had just as much film as I had, and then I was like, I gotta go, you know, but I was lucky, because my car um, was okay, and, because I parked it close to the bridge, but like, all the streets before it, all the cars were wrecked, because I was only one block from wow. where the building fell. Yeah, I, um, I remember the smell for forever is lingering i remember that ash making patterns of, of abstract patterns as a brush but um i mean i wasn't on ground zero but i worked at a one hour photo and i kept getting garbage bags from the fdny full of one-time used kodak cameras and they kept on shooting with flash in the dust and it kept on just blowing out and so you're getting these like tiny glimpses of things and it was interesting seeing how you guys, as trained professionals, looking for things to tell a story and how they were pulling things that they thought were just pertinent for people to see. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I remember seeing was uh, a kid was writing notes to their parents in the dust trying to find them. Wow. And wow. I just thought that was amazing that the fire department were, were keen to this because they're thinking about, I got to get people, where are the people? And they're probably thinking as well. And I think for you guys... I can't even imagine the sounds, the speed of everything happening, yeah. the smell of it. You know, you've got fire department over here, you've got near, uh, police department, and you've just got frantic people that just went to work that day and are covered from head to, I mean, you know, we're just covered in head to toe in dust. Yeah. What, what, did I you was feel one like? Of those people who was covered. So, how, so what was that like being a, almost a participant because you were in it, right? You weren't just right. documenting, right. you weren't, there wasn't a wall there for you guys. Were you covered? No. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think we were all we all got caught up in that big cloud of, of dust and smoke yeah. after the after both towers collapsed. Well, after each well, tower. Yeah. After, after each, each tower. tower. Yeah. But it was it. You know, when that happens, it like. You know, I was at the foot of the building when it fell like one block, right? That's wild. And just ran as fast as I could, and then it became. It was like the loudest sound you ever heard, yeah. right? And the floor kind of lifted underneath us, and then it all happened but uh, it was when that happens like the whole sky actually goes black okay and like all the oxygen got pulled out and you feel like you can't breathe at all and like you get impacted like it throws you down that cloud because it's heavy with debris you yeah. know and then I ended up like you know kind of find like feeling my way into a building and then getting into a building for a little Feeling bit. your way into a building. It's pitch black. Like, and yeah, it was how was it breathing? Total darkness. It was not great. You know, like, I felt like my sinuses were really bad and I couldn't breathe either. And then it took, like, a while to, like, you know, a few weeks, actually, probably to clear up, you know, where you feel better. It's just so wild, right? I mean, people think all you do is push a button, right? Right. Like, how many times have you heard that about our careers? That all you do? And, and I think that in that era, there was no way to document this if, if you guys didn't get down there and do your jobs. Right. And we wouldn't remember and we wouldn't see the impact of it. Uh, at what point did you say, all right, I got to get out of here? For me, it was after the second tower fell because, like, it was so, the air was just so bad. And I also knew I had to make my deadline. Um, and I was near the hospital and I saw that nobody was being pulled into it. So... I felt like, um, and I had been down there for hours because I had seen it happen. So like I had been there a long time. So then I decided to leave because I was like, I have to make the deadline and I need to get, find my car and then like drive through thousands of people walking and then like, you know, make it to Midtown um, to Newstay's offices. They were on park in 32nd at the time. And yeah. then they downloaded my stuff and did, you know, everything. I feel like I would have been like, I'm just never getting in a car today. Like, it, it was that crazy that day. I was lucky. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you had a car. Um, I know. Yeah. On the subway, so right? You, were, you, went on, you rode on the subway. Well, da going down, and then, uh, I, then I ended up walking from lower Manhattan to Midtown oh. from, uh, uh, to, yeah. to, to our office, the AFP office in, uh, on, 49th, on 47th Street. So 
um, I had gone after the second tower had collapsed. I had found a, a bank building, and the the uh, the phones were still working in the, in the bank office. Yeah, so, the landlines were working. Yeah, the but land, not the, the cell our cell phones down, were yeah. right. Yeah, my cell cell phone. When, when we had these ancient cell phones back then, the flip so. phones, the star taps. Yeah, you yeah. know. Yeah, so so that wasn't working. So the, the uh, I, that's when I called. Um, our, our uh, Washington D.C. is where the the AFP North American headquarters is. So they they're the hub for all the coverage in North America. And I talked to our our uh, the main photo uh, director, and she told me about the, well, the two planes in Manhattan, and then the, the one plane in, in crashing into the Pentagon, and then a, at that time the fourth plane was was missing. Right. And the AFP office is very close to the White House, so they were afraid that they were they, they, they could be a target of, of the fourth mm -hmm. plane. Uh, and then uh, uh, the, the director said, "Well, I, uh, keep shooting for a while, but then make, you got to make your way back up to the office to to uh, transmit pictures." So so I did that, uh, man, managed to do that. But I think you were talking about like the, the stories and all that, and I, I think like with Jennifer, I was sort of running against this crowd of people and at one point I think I just decided that the, that people really are the going to be the story here uh, that there there are plenty of pictures of the building itself yeah. but just mm -hmm. concentrating on what how people are trying to cope with this uh, this uh, you, you can't even call it a disaster I mean it's beyond a disaster I think yeah I think that was the thing that uh, if you didn't live in New York I remember, I remember, I don't know if you remember this, but like people were like, I didn't even think of New Yorkers as people until this happened. Now I feel sorry for them and stuff like that. Like they just thought we were these like impersonal species. And yeah. then they saw like we actually had loss and we had emotion and things right, happen. Right. And I think that being on the ground, seeing that, what you guys were grabbing, you know, I think is what relayed the story because we had the helicopters showing us the mass scale. We saw what was going on and it was a really crazy time where we just didn't know I mean, when were we attacked like that on this, in this close to civilian uh, areas? Like, it was just crazy. You know? Right, right. Not on a scale. Something like this is. Was it, uh, as far as an industry goes, was it just like a melee of all the photojournalists going for it? Or was there an organization to it? Did you rely on each other at all? Or, what, you know, was there anything going on as far as a community goes amongst the photojournalists? I mean, there was a lot of community, you know, all the all the freelancers and all the staffers just kind of like banded together because it's such an exceptional thing to cover and a dangerous, you know, situation for everybody. And I think we probably all shared information, you know, like a right. lot of, there were a lot of street closer, closures or like, you know, certain uh, focuses that we might have wanted at the time, you know. At, after the first tower had collapsed, I think I remember walking through a plaza in Lower Manhattan and seeing other photographers that I knew. Mm -hmm. And uh, so people were doing, like Jennifer said, trading information and just finding out uh, what, what people knew because cause we, we hardly knew anything. It's, it's weird because uh, I, I talked to people who were at a distance and got incredible photos of, of, of uh, the second, especially the second plane crashing into the tower and also people jumping from, from the towers and they had a totally different experience than we had, when, and we were, we were basically at the base of the tower. So right. it was interesting to, to compare. A few, I mean, much much uh, uh, later, just to compare uh, experiences, because we had completely different experiences, and it almost was. It almost seemed like if you were further away, or even watching on television, it was it was almost more horrific. It also depended. It depended where you were sitting. Right. I mean, not sitting, standing at the time, right? So, like, yeah. for example, I was on Church Street in Fulton, right, which is where the Borders bookstore was and, like, the main, Borders. you know. Right. It was, like, where the main everything was going on. Yeah. But some of our friends were on the back side of the building, you know, like where the um, the West Side Highway was, you know, yeah. and, or, like, the Winter Garden Theater, like that side of it. And, you know, I think when... Um, it definitely impacted on the way that we covered it, but also like people got hurt on the who were on the back side of it more. Well, actually, people got hurt on the front side too, right? But they, but maybe we had other ways to run, you know, that were different. So I think it was all kind of dependent on that. 
Yeah, I feel like uh, one of the probably the most key information was one, where was it safe to even get through to? Right. And two, where were the key elements happening? It was a mass scale. It was, it was, it was 360 degrees, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. right. Yeah, it was just ha pretty much happening all around. And then the uh, firefighters and police were all around. So it was just, uh, just like, you know, very, very chaotic atmosphere. Well, and I was actually one of the first photographers there, I think. And I kept on going down streets and, like, you know, just seeing masses of people, but not, like, a ton of people coming out from the buildings right away. And then I found them, you know. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, you know, but there weren't that many photographers there yet. I think a lot of them had went around to the other side because they got there faster, gotcha. you know. Yeah. Um, so I had, like, kind of a unique view. Well, you, you, kind of, know. you probably had a unique view also because they weren't closing so fast, right? You could get through in a little bit probably well, earlier. Well, no, I like no? snuck in the, you know, like, you know, the, I just kind of made my way, mm -hmm. you know. But yeah. we also had press passes and like, you right. know, we were there to cover that. Well, so, you know, it's happening. You're, you're frantic, looking for what to do. Keep your head together, professional, everything like that. After the fact, were you, after you started hearing things about people getting sick from the air and stuff, was that a major concern for you guys? Uh, I mean, it had to have been, right? Like now or back then? Back, back then, you mean, it, was, it was pretty quick after the fact that we started thinking about the air quality that happened, yeah. what was in the air, and you right. guys were in it. Yeah, I was worried about it because I, um, I have sinus problems from it, and it, like did before, but then after it was really bad. So, yeah, I was worried about that. Um, and now, of course, you know, you hear about all the horrible stories of, you know, people passing and... So. Yeah, I, it's 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 never ending. I feel mm -hmm. you know what I mean, especially uh, when you go to the memorial and you see the people still laying roses down, still remembering, and people right. still mourning. You know, yeah. it's it's that fresh still. You know. Well, I was this morning. I was actually covering an event upstate New York for a memorial, like a 9/11 memorial, for this young girl who. Um, you know lost her father and then they're you know doing this whole uh, memorial but like for the community and it was a really lovely story and I was like it kind of is interesting how your life has come so full circle you know all these years later still covering the same thing it's true but I mean actually you actually you actually have a, a shot here oh, from yeah. this is the woman in the lower and then here's her later yeah so I do a lot of I did a lot of follow-up stories um, on my work. So if you go back one, this woman is named Rose Paris Candola. And um, I followed up with her many times over the years. And if you go to the next shot, this is her on the same corner where we were uh, 10 years later. And Stan, you look like you stayed up with people a little bit as well from the... Um... Right. There were two, fo two people that we eventually found out who they were, which is sort of a miracle in situations like this many times you just never know who you're photographing mm -hmm. uh, so ed ed fine was in the one photo okay let's see uh yeah. yeah if you go back about about four pictures oops yeah so ed fine is the man in the suit carrying a briefcase in the in the one photo after i think that was after the second tower had collapsed and uh Forbes magazine used it on the cover of their magazine, uh, the issue the following week, Jeez. and the editor had written in a in a note saying, "If if you're this person, please contact us. We're trying to wow. find you." Wow. Because I I didn't have an identification on him, and so nobody really knew what, who he was. And I think a friend of his saw it on the newsstand and rec recognized him, and so he contacted the editor, and the, the editor called me and said, "We we found this guy. His name is Ed Fine." And he said, "Can you photograph him for us?" So I. I went and did some pictures both for Forbes and for, for AFP. He lives in New Jersey and he had this amazing story that he actually sat down and he wrote, wrote out six pages of, of his memory. He said so he could remember it and so that he could give it to his grandchildren, yeah. I think, as, as something that he, that he uh, went through. He, he was on the, I think, about the 89th floor of one of the buildings when the, the plane hit. 89th floor. Uh, and mm -hmm. then so he led a bunch of people down the fire escape uh, and, and so they walked down the uh, almost the entire length of the building to the to the ground, and and then that's that's where I photographed. And then he was hold still in the picture. I noticed he was still holding his briefcase, which is in the, in the photo in New Jersey. 
he had, he had cleaned his briefcase and cleaned the suit that he wore. Uh, so it was sort of amazing that that he was he kind of had it with had wherewithal to keep his blue briefcase with him as he's walking through the debris and just trying to trying to get mm-hmm. home. But it's it's wild that he wrote six pages because you said that today. You'd be like, well, why didn't you just pull out your phone and record something while you were doing it? Or they did this. They did the story corp um, uh, site. Do you, I mean, like that's not a site, but there is actually there. There was a site downtown where you can go to a place and record your All history right. of what happened, um, or you can call it in. I did that. It's so the there's end. like a whole database of everybody's yeah. stories. Actually, there, there's a question in the chat from Kevin asking. I was wondering if there were any moments that stood out that you didn't end up shoot, that you didn't get shots of. Was there something that you probably saw fleeting, passing by you that happened that you wish, that's something I'll remember, but it's, it's just something I didn't get because yes. you can't get everything. There was this woman in the building that I had went into. Um, I had went up to like the third floor and before, I wasn't shooting yet I actually remember I had to go to the bathroom to like wash my skin because the debris was actually really um, itchy did you find that do you remember that I remember that but that didn't make sense I was wearing a short sleeve shirt and I remember that and then I called my editor but then I was going around the office like a little bit just kind of like figuring out my next move and I saw this woman on the ground and I have one image of it because I had film Um, and she was praying with uh, you know some rosary beads and this other woman in front of her said don't take a picture of her don't take a picture of her but I had already taken a picture of her but then I didn't take more pictures of her because everybody was so fragile do you know like so um, I have the one image and I actually looked at it last night and I was like oh, I wish I had more of that you yeah. know <laughs> um, I don't really remember a sort of a kind of a blur when I think about the, the day just trying to photograph as much as you can uh, uh, given given the circ- circumstances I, I think the I think just trying to concentrate on people I know that the, the, the picture of, of Marcy borders the woman in, in the, mm-hmm. co- covered in the dust I, it, it turns out I, I just shot one frame of that and right. uh, before she she moved so it was it was at one one particular moment and, and I know that people have the tendency to, to kind of blast away with the cameras and, and get right. dozens we were, of pictures. We were shooting sparingly a little bit. When yeah. you have film, like you weren't yeah. doing the same kind of work. Uh, and I shot Marcy Borders, actually, um, as a follow-up story. And I remember she was so sad. Yeah. Like, you know? Yeah, it was a, yeah, it was a terrible story. And um, I, I wish I had two digital cameras, but the the memory cards back then it was kind of comical because they were we i like think we had 28 uh, gigabytes or something or, no not even not <laughs> it was even. like it was megabytes. Megabytes. megabytes yeah it was, it was 512 like megabytes 512 right. or that was if a big you were lucky. card yeah, yeah. Or like 256 megabytes you go oh wow i have a big card <laughs> you yeah think about that now and it's, it's only kinda, a few megapixel like it wasn't really what film was putting out at the time i think this was like seven seven and a half megapixel yeah camera. 35 mm-hmm. millimeters like 24 megapixels so it was like you were kind of getting, uh, you're, you're getting fast images out there. And I think one of the things you probably were when you got back were just shocked how much you actually did get, right? Because you're probably just moving so fast. You didn't even think about what you already shot. You were thinking about the next thing. What next? What next? No? Yeah, a little bit because it was yeah. e- editing through. I, I think that uh, we, would, we would, I would see pictures that, um, that I ha- hadn't really remembered shooting just because you because so much was going on right. um and then the uh the, the funny thing about uh marcy borders that again we didn't know who she was and that that picture got a lot of use in in mm-hmm. the media this image was probably the most viral thing i've seen from that day i mean i every every year it pops up I've yeah all over the place it's yeah unreal. it comes up i think it's one of these mm-hmm. pictures that i think people could relate to as a human being because they they see a person just trying to cope with with the chaos and, and the, the craziness around them. Well, I, I tell you what stands out is like, it's the color theory. I think you see all these images of white smoke and these yeah. bright sunny days, and this is like this yellow, and the human is just wiped clear so you can see her face. It, it was very strange, because you, you, she was completely covered, and it, it kind of reminded me of these pictures you see from Pompeii, of, of the, uh, yeah. Yeah. from the volcanoes. And yeah. just, just that kind of idea. And the, the yellow is just a, a result of the digital 
uh, white balance. It, it's it's the, the warm, light. yeah, the yeah. warm light inside. Um, and then we, we didn't find out, it turns out for months, who she was. And the, her family finally contacted the Washington AFP office and, and identified her. So we, uh, the, uh, the New York bureau chief and I went over. She lived in Bayonne, New Jersey, and we finally met her and I heard her story, which is a pretty, pretty amazing story. Uh, but she was very, very frightened. She, she said she wouldn't, would never go back into Manhattan. She was wow. really scared. So She was. Yeah, so I think that's, you, she you was. probably heard that. And then you followed up with her? I did, yeah, for who I was working for. If you go to, I, um, if in my series, there's a picture number two. I don't know sure. if you, if you guys in the chat have any questions, or anyone here has any questions, please feel free. That's the whole point of doing live, people, all right? You're all part of this. All right, if we go into this. Number two, it's not. Number two? Yeah, that one. That mm -hmm. woman is actually named um, Elaine Duke. I found a bunch of the people in my photos. Um, she burned 80% of her body, actually. But this was just before the towers uh, fell, and she actually lived. And I only knew that because um, six months later, or maybe it was six months, I don't know how many months it was, I was doing a story about somebody from 9-11 who was uh, released from the hospital, and I saw her, and I was like, could that be her? Could that be her? And it was. Um, I followed up. Like, she was there with her twin sister, actually. Wow. Yes. And so I kind of, like, saw this resemblance. And I was like, hmm, let me think about that. Um, and then I told my editor, you know, that I was going to follow up on it. So I just kind of researched it. But then she wasn't granting any interviews with anybody. So I, um, I felt like an affinity towards her because I worried about her this whole time um, thinking that she didn't make it and then I wrote her this whole letter you know and I asked her if she saw the picture and she did and then I told her that I was a twin too and then she finally granted me the interview so that was that was great well that's that's a massive coincidence and like something to connect on is the person covering is a twin covering someone who's a twin who both were in the same all Maybe that's why she gave me the interview. I I'm don't know. I mean, sometimes you, that's a lot of what I think photojournalism is, is, is connection to get that extra step to mm -hmm. get that full story, no? Right. I mean, but I actually wrote her like a handwritten letter, you know, because even though, you know, because it wasn't so techy like people are now. I remember that. How, so. how do you think it would have been different today with the with the technology and the connection and the speed of things do you think you would have made these connections do you think there would have been faster connections do you think you would have found people easier or do you think we've just been that much we would have moved past yeah things i do think that people would have, we would have found people faster because you know you're seeing things like rose was found i feel like through like a friend from virginia or something who had seen the picture because the picture was um newsweek ran it as like their picture of the year and um that picture, you know, like resonated everywhere. It went everywhere. Oh, this is crazy. Not that one. The oh. one of Rose, actually, the one before it. That one. And then it was considered um, one of the top 25 pictures of uh, from Life magazine of the day. Um, so anyway, somebody in Virginia found that her, and then I followed up with her. And I've met her many times. Like I said, she's really a very good person, right. an so interesting person. She's like... She does like bodybuilding now, which I find really lovely. I'm sure this made her a stronger person in many ways. Yes, it changes, <laughs> it changes you. You know, I always thought about this picture as kind of like we talked about it, me and Rose, kind of like the scream, you know, the um, the painting. Yeah, uh, by German Monk. expressionism, yeah. Yeah, kind of has that feel to it. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Martin. Uh, did you guys feel like you suffered any psychological trauma from the seeing so much horrific instances in one day like that or is this really like what photojournalism that's where the you kind of build up the callus and you kind of understand the job a little more or did this really have an effect on you as a person i mean i th it had an effect on me it had to have, you know? i mean it had to have, of right? course but you kind of have to um compartmentalize a little bit like after because you i think it was kind of healing for me to go down every day and shoot the aftermath stuff, oh that's interesting you know so it's um, kind of a little art therapy sort of yeah. in a way. 
Yes. But after, for a long time, at, when a, a plane was low and, like, I heard it, I was always like, oh, oh you wow. know, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I thought that the day, the coverage in the days afterwards, I thought that was harder than September 11th because you really saw the effect of this on, on people, how, how this really affected people. And, uh, I mean, on September 11th, to me, I was, I was just trying to get as many pictures and trying to, trying to make get a story from what was happening. Uh, but then uh, uh, for us, it was just uh, days and weeks, or well, even months, where th this was the only story that we were covering. And so you, yeah. really, you really saw the effect on, on how it affected uh, pe uh, people and, and their lives. So to me, that had a bigger, bigger impact on me. And it was really sad, though, because all your stories were sad for a long right. time, yeah. you know, like it could be inspiring and uplifting, right? Like, you know, people persevering and all of that is beautiful. But we saw, there was weeks, remember when we just did funerals, like right. weeks of firefighter funerals and so many things. And it was very, um, that was hard. That, you that, know? that was my next question is, uh, was there a point where there's just so much, it was just this monotonous, just, you know, down point, this emotional drop for so long, were there these moments that kept you going where there's something that like you saw these people healing in a way and you were kind of lending a hand to that maybe? I feel like the, all you guys did was yeah, really cathartic. contribute. Yeah. You know? It is cathartic. I mean, what we do is like um, very important to document, you know, life as it's happening and um, show the true narrative, you know, but also, you know, to work through it, you know, it, it can be very helpful to not just me, but like universally, right? When you're covering a story like this, that's, you know, you wanna have that kind of um, impact on people. Like if you go to, there's a picture of um, a police officer who's carrying, I'll, if you keep on going, there. This, this woman is named Cheryl, um, yeah, Cheryl Tyson. And the police officer is named Ramon Suarez. Um, he, after he dropped her off, he went back up to the towers, and then they fell within like just a few minutes. So he died in the towers. And then his uh, mother saw the picture, and she told me that it was really um, meaningful to her because she saw her son as a hero, you know. Yeah. And his his daughter now is a police officer. Well, I'm, sh I'm and sure. And I reunited them, oh, Cheryl, cool. with the um, with the family. Yeah. Well, I, I got to tell you, like uh, when 9/11 happened, I was I was younger and I was full. I was from punk life, right? And everybody was kind of like finally chilling out with hating on cops and kind of unifying and kind of being like they saw how hard it can be. They saw what it had to be to, to for service. Uh, did you guys make any relationships with uh, any of the fire departments or police beyond this? Was it mainly civilians for you guys, or did you get closer to like the New York City uh, infrastructure? I think it was mainly. Uh, I think people who were in the in the towers. I mean, f families of those people. Uh, I I don't think anything. I don't think I met a lot of firefighters or police officers who, who were involved. I mean, there was there were tons of funerals, of course, yeah. and things like that, um, and. Uh, but I think just uh, it, then you would you would meet people who uh, were connected in, uh, with the tragedy in, in, in some ways that uh, either they, they they had family or friends who were in the buildings or or they were uh, they were helping or they, they lived in the area or uh, or there are a lot, a lot of different connections over the years. Uh, Jose in the chat is asking, what is the first image that pops in your head when someone asks you about 9/11? Is there just like that first strike of Rose. Rose. Yeah. But, you know, when, it's a little different for me because I did a lot of tangent stories on, um, like, Fresh Kills Landfill and, uh, you know, the Emmys, the medical examiner's office and places like that. So I met kind of different characters. Um, the people who ran the Fresh Kills Landfill were the FBI and um, they did a, like a beautiful, they had a whole, it was beautiful there. And um, the guy from the FBI writes me every September 11th, I wake up to an email at like six o'clock in the morning from him and he puts me on this group email um, of remembering. 
where you stand. Uh, yeah, actually, I, I, I'm still in touch with Ed Fine, and uh, I, like we email each other on, on September 11th. So, uh, and I know he's, he has had has health problems in the last few years, but um, it's, it's sort of interesting to to be in touch with somebody like that and over a long long period of time. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. But I mean, the, this is such a shared experience that I, how could you not connect on that level, right? Right, yeah, because then um, w one of the photos in, in the series that I have is it was a colleague of ours, David Hanshu, who's, uh, he was very close to one of the towers when it collapsed, and both his legs were broken. Uh, and so uh, I ended up photographing him at, at the funeral, a firefighter funeral, actually the uh, funeral of uh, Michael Judge, who was the fire, uh, fire department priest. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I, had, I had assumed the picture was taken uh, maybe a, w a week or so later, but uh, I looked at the date of when I took this picture, and it was, it was September 15th. So four days after this happened, uh, David is, is, well, I, think, I don't think he was completely out of the hospital, but they, they yeah, got... Yeah, I don't think they, so. He's on a, on a gurney. Yeah, they got him to right? the funeral on a, on a gurney, and, he, and he's greeting uh, firefighters and police officers. Uh, and and so um, and he and he complete he recovered from his yeah. his injuries so and and he, he was he's a, a good friend of both of ours yeah has there been any assignments since this that you felt like uh some, whatever you went through on 9-11 to cover it and even the continuation of the stories do you feel any of that added to your skills or insight as to cover the next thing that happens lately i feel like this was such like a shock of training for anybody. Mm. What do you mean exactly? Like So like for example, getting going from zero to ground zero mm -hmm. from like you weren't covering this to now covering something that's happening frantically every second to then having to keep up with the stories, having to go forward with the connections and see where things went to. Did any of this you feel sharpened yourself or you you didn't even realize this was something you should keep in mind for a story to keep telling the story? Yeah, I think everything we do yeah. adds to our our skills. Uh, two years after this, uh, AFP sent me to Iraq. Um, I did two two trips to Iraq um, af uh, after the the so-called war was over, uh, and and I think the um, I think just being being aware of things around you all of the time uh, is is a good skill to have for a photojournalist, yeah. um, and and also sort of keeping keeping up on the news and being able to. I'm 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 not a very good talker with people. <laughs> So, uh, and, and so I sort of have to force myself to talk to people and find out their stories. And in, in Iraq, it was interesting to hear from soldiers w wondering why they were there. Mm. Well, I mean, what, why, why, why is this a, a country where we, we invaded after, be, allegedly because of September 11th, when, of course, that wasn't the case at all. That, uh, Saddam Hussein had nothing to do with <laughs> September 11th. Mm. So we go down a rabbit hole forever. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question to chat. But you do evolve, oh. you know. Like right. we all, we we just, you know, your skills become very um, refined after doing this for so long. Yeah. And, you know, being a photojournalist, you your timing has to be like impeccable, you know. And so you just kind of gain greater skills and apply those skills to whatever shoot we're doing. You know, obviously all these stories kind of unfolded and evolved as well, but well, you know, like now you it's like you're, we're very fine tuned, right? Like, right. you know, and if and we have to run into a breaking news situation, we could totally do it, you it's know? It's like a sense, but, isn't it? Like you kind of know you have to follow that because that might be the moment right. that might, right? Like you know the story, you know where to look for it and you assess things very quickly. And it's kind of like we're, um, like almost hyper focused, I would say. You yeah, know, I mean, in assessing any kind of situation, even if it's a portrait, you know, you you know exactly how to kind of finesse it, or right. and look, you know, for where the composition should be and the moment. And then, uh, I mean, for years before September 11th, Jennifer and I covered all sorts of spot news stories, mm -hmm. and so it's that you 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 gain that experience uh, up to that point, and then so we just used whatever knowledge we had at that point to to cover to cover this story yeah there's actually a question in the chat of uh how do you feel when you go back to these locations today in the city and you you do because i've seen shots from both of you like the memorial lights and everything yeah. uh is there is there just like this you know memory wash that goes over you or a sense of feeling or a weight or anything 
I mean, I don't love spending time down there, like, just, like, to hang out, you know? I'll go for work and stuff. And I always think it's pretty and kind of peaceful. And I used to go down every year to um, where I was standing when it happened. Like, if you if you go into the work, you'll see, like, uh, three pictures of this wall. Um, because I just felt like I needed to be there. But we'll look it up for a second and see. Yeah. So. Yeah, if you <laughs> go to the one, one, that one, yeah, and the one after, and then one more, right? And I would just kind of shoot it from different, that's where the Oculus is, that's where I was, right? Now, do you guys know where the Oculus is, right? <laughs> so then that was removed, and then after it was removed, I didn't feel like I had to go down there anymore so much. Yeah. How are you? Uh, I wasn't sure exactly where I was in certain places. I could kind of map it out a little bit. A few years ago, AFP uh, did a video. They interviewed me, and they wanted to walk around to, to the places that I, uh, that I photographed, and we're going to kind of do show, uh, show the pictures that I took with the, with the sites, what they look like now. And we, I, we might have found a, a few of the places. Um, and I remember going, uh, we, we covered a lot of business stories for mm -hmm. AFP, both at, on Wall Street and in the Trade Center. I mean, we'd, we'd always go, be going into one of the towers of the Trade Center or the buildings around there in the, in the World Financial Center. So, so uh, uh, I, I knew the area pretty well just, just from be, being down there. Um, so, and it, it was kind of, uh, up until recently, it, w it was kind of eerie to be around there when, um, when the buildings were still destroyed and there yeah. wasn't much construction. And then the first, the first building was constructed, and, and I think it started to. Um, and now it's I think nice. It more, you know, yeah, it's nice. like very pleasant to be down there, but I don't like to linger down there. I find it know? a little odd when I go down there. To be honest with you, I see people like taking vacation photos there now, and I'm mm -hmm. kind of like, this wasn't that long ago. Like, yeah. It still hits me hard. I still smell it when I when I go down there. I still remember. Mm -hmm. I think it's like the most tied thing to me is the scent of it. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question in the chat that I actually. You know, it's myself. interesting. Okay. The day before, though, I actually had an assignment in one of the World Trade Center buildings, and it was like I think on the tenth floor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was just the day before, and uh, so it's kind of crazy, uh, like yeah. how twenty four hours makes such a big difference. You know. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. There's a question in the chat from Jose, uh, which I'm wondering myself. Is there a line where you won't take the picture? Like, was there something happening that day where you're like, I don't know, this just shouldn't be, it's someone's down point, it's really heartbreaking. Like, is there something that just shouldn't, you sh that you're just like, nah, you held back? I mean, no, because our job is to kind of, you know, we see people at their most vulnerable and at their, some like maybe at the worst part of their life sometimes, but also, on the best part of their lives too, you know? So I think it's all fair to shoot. Yeah, I think, I mean, grief is a hard thing to, to photograph, but I think it's it's one thing that we could try to get across to people that this is something that uh, human beings are involved in, right. in this story. And, and this is uh, this is a result of, of, uh, of an attack like this or a tragedy like this. Can we talk about this image for a second? Sure. What 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 compelled you to shoot this? So I was leaving. Like I wanted to leave and I was still shooting, but I didn't really want to leave. And then I saw that. And I just thought that person didn't even need to be there because they were so scared they left their shoes, you know? Yeah. It's it's uh I thought that was one of the most interesting things during you the also, time. You yep. also see a lot of footprints around yeah. Yeah. It, which really makes it eerie, I think. Yeah, and then the guy in the background because it was so, you know, toxic that everybody had um, masks on. Yeah, I, I remember when it happened uh, on the news. There was um, they stopped these three young girls uh, that were collecting the trash, and they were just picking up the papers that they found from the World Trade Center that were from the offices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And they're like, "This is this is so pertinent," and it, I don't think anybody ever would have picked that up if there was mm -hmm. any other day. But to, for some reason, they felt like this probably came from ninety floors up. And yeah. this is what I'm going to do to remember this day or whatever. Because that's the thing, right? Never forget. And everyone chooses their way to never forget this, mm -hmm. I believe. Uh, and I think the younger generation we have now, especially ones, uh, people that are trying to be photojournalists in the younger generations, going to college right now or, I mean, just discovering photography in, in their late teens or whatever as a, as a career path, 
I don't think they understand the weight or what it was, what this was. So that's why I thought it was so important that we all gather and hear direct from people who are there, who do this professionally. Uh, if anybody has any questions in the crowd for uh, for Stan or Jennifer, please feel free in the chat as well. Okay, <laughs> very lively crowd for a live stream. Um, I'm really glad we got this together. I hope we can do uh, some more stuff. Uh, the this is the new event space. You guys are always welcome here. We're doing events at five o'clock. Uh, Two, three times a week and this is the events channel so please hit subscribe you'll be seeing stuff like this multiple times a week in fact I'll put a QR code right here so you can so you can scan that if you're at home right now and don't forget to subscribe and like it helps out the channel uh, and also if you're watching the playback please leave some comments for Stan and Jennifer uh, so they can uh, hear your feedback on this or any questions you might have any questions from anybody here pretty heavy images right you can say yes Let's say a little louder, please. Yeah. yeah, we're from New York. We make a little noise, everybody. Thank you. Um, this is 9-11, and it doesn't have to be super grim, but it is super important, right? So I think, especially if someone that hasn't lived through it, it's important to know exactly what happened and what it took for professionals in our industry to, to work through it and be part of it in our own way. I think you both basically convey the idea of you doing your part, right? Yeah. Those firefighters are the part. The police did the part, EMTs did the part, and photojournalists absolutely did their part. So I want to thank you guys both for heading down there in a dangerous situation and keeping your head together and documenting all the stuff that we were able to see today. You guys are allowed to clap for them. It's okay. <laughs> thanks, thanks for having us. No, of course. Is there anything you'd like to leave uh, people with as far as your experience or where you think photojournalism for the future is going or anything that's uh, I, I, I'm very curious I, I feel like you guys have such a rare experience under your belt that it's it's wild I mean it really is and uh, I think the fact that you're still going you're still following up shows yeah. how much you actually care and invested as humans not just professionals hmm. Hmm. I mean I think that it's it's kind of interesting to me because I also teach photojournalism and it's interesting that my students really don't understand um, that day, you know, or yeah. the context of it exactly. Like, I had one student who said to me, I had said that I called my editor when I got, um, you know, finally a phone to work because I, I needed him to know that I was alive and then he could, like, let everybody else know also that I was, right? Um, like, my family and stuff. But then I called them also. But she's like, why did you call your editor first? And I said, and she's like, didn't you use your cell phone? And I was like, no, you know, we didn't have that. And I was like, and she didn't like understand the gravity of the day and how everything didn't right. work. And it wasn't like, you know, there was no signal. There was no, um, that point of view wasn't, you know, they don't know it. And so I think it's important to, you know, like educate and let, you know, the day still live. You know? I don't think some people realize the world literally stopped mm -hmm. that day. Right. That was right. wild. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The, the oh, well, the, definitely this country, but uh, you're right. Right. All, all all around the world. So, I, I think well, it it's good to hear that there are still photojournalism students. Yeah. At least that. <laughs> yeah, when you think about it, the the, yeah. the media is constricting so much, but there there still are outlets and. I know online there are there are more picture stories than I ever saw in yeah. print, which is which is a really good sign. And I think for for people learning photojournalism, I, I think the idea is just to learn as much as you can, and and talk to talk to people who are professionals and and, mm -hmm. and learn learn from people, but also just go out and take pictures, find the stories, and right. and um, uh, make make some good stories from from the from people that you meet or or people out there because there there's a million stories out there and, yeah. and they're definitely worth worth telling and there are, there are outlets that are uh, that will publish publish those stories so I, I think just, uh, if 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 you're a photojournalism student just, just stick with it because it's uh, eventually you'll find outlets for the work. Yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's and a, it's a great craft. I mean, it's inspiring every day, you know, to do what we do, yeah. to to make pictures is such a privilege, you know, to tell people stories. And it's really important to, you know, always do that with, you know, trying to find the truth. Yeah, and, and 
it, to me, it was a very, it was a, it's a very interesting job because every day is totally different. There are never, yeah. there's, there are never two days that are the same. Even if you're photographing the same um, event or, 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 or the same thing for for days or weeks on end, every, every single day is different, mm -hmm. and you meet different people, and mm -hmm. you you find out interesting things about about people, what they're what they're doing, what they're involved in, and. Uh, and uh, so it's, I mean, good, good or bad, you find, find out things about people. Yeah, so, so if you're that kid with your phone that's in everyone's face constantly <laughs> taking pictures of everything, then think about the story you're telling and maybe think to go a little more further. Get a real camera, too. Oh, wow. <laughs> Stan, wow, you're getting, man. All right, Stan's got his claws out. It's all right. <laughs> Look, a tool's a tool, and if yeah, that's yeah, what's yeah. Uh, good for you, then that's what we do. And if you got, I just think it's amazing that in this era we can self-publish so quick. Even yeah. if it's to like an audience of 100 or you're going right, to the New right. York Times or whatever, you're still able to go tell your stories. It's just a matter of who it reaches at some point. Right. Um, I mean, even, even if you follow an Instagram or someone tells you like, I review pizza, it's still like, this guy's telling me a story of which neighborhoods yeah. do what type of pizza where. Um, just to keep, leave things on a little bit more of a lighthearted note, just because it got a little heavy in here. Well, <laughs> so they, <laughs> I do see some some friends that aren't photographers that, that post series of pictures, like essentially they're posting a story on their yeah. Instagram uh, with their with pictures from their phone, and they, they do a great job with with the the subject matter that that they're that they're doing because they they're really into it, and mm -hmm. they kind of somehow they're I mean they, they they probably can't describe their process, but somehow visually they're. They're seeing pictures and they're seeing stories and they post them. Yeah, that's my argument when people rag on phones a bit. It's more like, well, isn't it helping like this visual imagery literacy where they're actually understanding more of composition? Under they're kind of we're raising kids to kind of create images younger and they're understanding how they're getting their points across to people when they're getting feedback from it. I just feel like uh, we're becoming more and more visual storytellers. It's opened a lot of things. Like you don't have to go get a camera. You can be ingesting images nonstop. And did that make sense too? Did that image get that story across? No. Why not? So when you go shoot that party, what are you going to do? You know, like that kind of a thing. It's kind of half and half though, because uh, the workshops that I that I do, there's some, <laughs> there's the skill level is is pretty yeah, pretty broad. So that. so you do see people who who want to be want to. Uh, want to do photography a lot, so they they invested in a in a camera, but they never learned the the basics and the fundamentals, right. and so they're kind of they're used to just taking a phone and sort of snapping away, and they think that that's the the, the camera will work that way, but then the, there isn't the the learning process about things like composition, which is an important thing. I get a lot of questions, technical questions about the mm -hmm. mechanics, which which are sort of beside the point. You want to say, well, what's in the picture? What are you going to put in the picture? Well, you know, you can just do it. You can do a class here in photojournalism. It's cool. Yeah. I mean, look, this is why I built this space. So you guys can all come. We can all elevate each other. Stan can learn how to talk to people better. <laughs> you know? <It'll, laughs> it's all good. You're doing good. <laughs> no, nah, you're doing great. Don't worry about it. It's, it's, um, it's really great that you guys came through. I'm really glad that Adorama let me put this panel together because you're looking at retail floor that they could have said should have been kiosks and merch, but they're here trying to give you guys something that'll tie you tighter to our craft. And this is important, and this is how we go forward, and this is how we all elevate. So I wanna thank Jennifer Altman, I wanna thank Stan Honda, uh, and I wanna thank all you guys for showing up, I wanna thank Adderon for letting me do this. And if you guys are, are watching this on Black, yo, hit like, what do I got? I got 27 likes, what are you doing? <laughs> Do me a favor, hit like, it's free, all right? And uh, hit subscribe, because you're gonna be getting at least, th uh, all week long we're doing live streams, and at least two of them a week are coming from right here. So if you're ever in New York, come stop by 42 West 18th Street, sell a little more, he's super lonely back there. I'm looking at him, cried himself, he's looking at me right now. And uh, yeah, thank you guys so much, and to everybody, uh, do yourself a favor and Google 9-11 images today and just see what that day was. Don't just hear about, never forget. All right, we thank good? You. Thank you guys. Thanks, All right, man. thank you guys.